सब्सक्राइब नाउ एंड प्रेस द बेल आइकन नेवर मिस एन अपडेट हेलो एंड वेलकम टू हेल्थ लाइव एट सीनियर्स टुडे वी आर डिलाइटेड टू हैव हियर विद अस डॉक्टर पी के ग्रंट हु इज चीफ जस्टिस यू नो वन ऑफ वेटरन कार्डियोलॉजिस्ट इन 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 इंडिया welcome to health live at seniors today dr grant how are you i am fine good evening how are you doing <laughs> good evening and uh, you know it is such a pleasure to have you uh, have you here i i would uh, first take the liberty of introducing us uh, introducing you so dr pk grant is chief cardiologist chairman of cardiovascular services and managing trustee of the ruby hall clinic group of hospitals he has three major hospitals in pune including the well known uh, an iconic ruby hall clinic which is on sasoon road ruby hall clinic at wanavadi at hinjavadi and the latest addition is ruby hall clinic in satara road and i also hear this uh, that he is setting up something in the uh, in, in the amanora uh, uh, mall area and uh, 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 one of the biggest cancer facilities in the private sector in pune there are around uh, 5000 people or or working at the ruby hall Group of hospitals, making it one of the largest teaching hospitals in the country. Uh, Dr. Grant has 26 diagnostic centers across Maharashtra and Karnataka, with MRI and CT scan machines in places like Ahmednagar, Satara, Bhiid, Karad, Belgaum, Shirampur, Marigao, Indapur, Baramati, Gandhi, Dutch, Town, Sangamneer, Ragoli, and Tiru. Um, Ruby Hall Clinic is the largest cardiac center in Western India and comes second in India in the number of cases done. um which is perhaps an achievement for pune city it has completed more than 3 lakh angiographies 100000 angioplasties and 80000 open heart surgeries ruby hall clinic runs one of the largest cancer care centers in india and treats 130 cancer patients per day in a 10 story cancer building dr grant does nearly 18 crore of free treatment per year to help the poor and needy patients of western india he has been awarded the fsai award by the by the us uh, fellow of society of cardiovascular angiography and intervention in september 20 2008 dr grant was conferred with a prestigious fellowship of the american Car- college of cardiology welcome to health life once again dr grant it's a it's a privilege to have you here thank you very much thank you for inviting me here today so and grant, i appreciate uh, it dr grant tell me you know you uh, uh, Ruby Hall Clinic is um, is an iconic uh, hospital of uh, of Pune city is one of the VIP hospitals of Pune city as I could, as one knows uh, uh, how's it been doing you are expanding in a very big way yeah ruby hall clinic was started in 1959 by my father i came back from england in 1987 when ruby hall was a smallish hospital and then from this smallish hospital we are now having about 900 beds uh, in all at uh, the three hospitals and in the next two years we'll be going up to 1200 beds we are concentrating mostly in pune but the diagnostic centers that we have are all around pune in a vicinity of about 300 to 350 kilometers those diagnostic centers all have mris and ct scans so basically it's a hub and spoke approach which uh, i decided to get into and basically the hospital is uh, concentrates on most advanced technology i am very technology based i want the best technology for any hospital in india and today i can boast that ruby hall has more equipment than any other hospital in maharashtra state and that is a statement which i will stand by including bombay <laughs> we okay. are getting the cyber knife which is maybe the first cyber knife in uh, india the s7 model which nobody has the machine will arrive tomorrow to ruby because it will take 2 3 months to install it will be a machine that is used for treating cancer which a normal linear accelerator cannot do so it's a specific market but 10 or 15% of patients cannot be treated by linear accelerator this machine will do it in november december we are getting another machine which is called as linear accelerator based mri technology 
that I think will also be the first in the country or possibly in Asia. Very expensive. The one machine costs 100 crores. Doctor, would you then say that uh, just as uh, Mumbai has been over the years, Delhi has been there, Bangalore uh, uh, has, has also picked up in a very big way. Pune has, is becoming a, a major hub for, uh, uh, for medicine, for medical treatment. Yes, Pune has been a big hub for medical people. We get a lot of patients coming from Africa. Uh, we used to get a few from Europe, but because of this corona, this got disturbed. The biggest problem Pune has is connection internationally. We have only one flight from Dubai, and that is our biggest uh, headache. So people have to come to Bombay and then drive down to Pune. So we are requesting the government to put additional flights between Pune and uh, Dubai, Pune and uh, Qatar, where we'd like patients to come easily to the city of Pune without having to go to Bombay, because nobody wants to break journey, especially if you are not well. So yes, we are now, since Corona is practically over, we are going to go back to international tourism, back in a very big way, especially for patients of cancer and heart and ICU management. That's where Ruby Hall specializes. That's uh, absolutely. Doctor, I, when I was reading out your uh, profile, I noticed that the number of patients who have, whom you've treated, that is 300 angiographies, 100,000 angioplasties, and 80,000 open heart surgeries. Now, while, while the number is, is, is great to hear, but would you, would you say that the numbers of people who need this kind of treatment has increased in the last few years? Yeah, we are finding that the number of patients who require angiography and angioplasty are definitely going up. What we are finding is that it is happening in the younger age group more and more as against the older age group. When I was in medical school, the average age for getting a heart attack was 60 to 70s. Now we are finding more in the 40s and 50s. So there's definitely been a drift from the older age group to the younger, slightly younger age group. And there are many uh, risk factors that uh, are causing this problem. I will show you some very basic slides on uh, this if I have a few minutes. Right. We've got a small slide presentation, which okay. I will... So, Doctor, over to you for your presentation and uh, for our people over here, uh, those of you who are on Zoom and not on uh, uh, YouTube, etc., please post your questions. This is a never-before opportunity to, to have Dr. Grant in the house and uh, uh, he, he will answer your questions, which I will moderate. And uh, please put in your question with your age and your gender and I will put, put a pointer in. Uh, pointer, uh, right what do you, Dr. Grant? Okay, so I will just give me a short presentation of uh, of our uh, few slides that we have. Can you just get the slides moving? It's not moving. Yes. I'm just trying to start the slides now. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Okay, so this is the main uh, Ruby Hall Clinic, the main one. The one on the right-hand side is our Vanavi Hospital. Next slide. And a little bit about our beautiful city of Pune. Go ahead. And the main thing about uh, in cardiology is the cat lab or the angiography unit, where we take beautiful pictures of the arteries of the heart. So this is the heart of the heart, as I would call it. This is where we can find out whether a patient has got a blockage of the artery of the heart or not, and how do we treat these particular patients. We at Ruby Hall have got now, main Ruby Hall has got uh, four such machines which are running from eight in the morning to eight at night nonstop. Vanavri has got one and I've got actually one more machine in the Pimpri Chinchwad area. So we're running six such machines in Pune city. Next slide. Now, how big is the problem? It is the number one killer worldwide and coronary artery disease or heart disease causes 12 million deaths every year. So it is a very, very big problem. And there's an alarm increase in especially developing countries, especially like India. Next slide. 
Indians are more susceptible than any other ethnic group. 3.4 times more than America, six times more than the Chinese, 20 times more than the Japanese. And as I was just saying, they get the disease at a much younger age, five to 10 years younger than the average population of other cities. And the other problem is that the disease is more severe and more malignant in the Indian population. And I will tell you why. Next slide. So what happens in coronary artery disease? In coronary artery disease, what happens, or heart disease, there is atheromatic plaques that keep building up slowly and slowly in the arteries of the heart. And as you can see on the right-hand slide, as the disease progresses more and more, the atheroma becomes worse, the arteries get blocked, and that is why you get a heart attack. Next slide. Initially, there are no symptoms for a long time, and only when the blockage is more than 80% that you start getting chest pain or blockages. And when the artery completely blocks off, you get myocardial infarction or a heart attack. Some people can have sudden death at the same time. Next slide. So why me? Why does a particular person get heart disease and not other people? One is genetic predisposition. Good genes, good luck. Bad genes, bad luck, as I would put it. We Parsis are happy. We've got good genes. So because we've got good genes, it's good luck and God protects us. So the other is urbanization. Urbanization means that uh, you're living in a large town. Because you're living in a large town, there is a lot of stress. People have to undergo a lot of stress, a lot of problems. And because of that, coronary artery disease is more. There is another important risk factor is diabetes. Now, you must remember that anybody above the 60 years old, nearly 10% of the population is diabetic. And diabetes, what happens? It affects the arteries of the heart. They get smaller coronary arteries. And because they get smaller coronary arteries, they have much higher incidence of coronary artery disease. The other risk factor is cholesterol. Now, there is good cholesterol and bad cholesterol. The good cholesterol is called HDL. The bad cholesterol is the LDL. And normally, your cholesterol should be less than 200, normal cholesterol, and the LDL cholesterol should be less than 100. The HDL should be above 40. So remember these figures, 40, 100, and 200. 40 for HDL, LDL is 100, and uh, normal cholesterol should be less than 200. And this is a typical example of a patient who's got cholesterol. You can see around the eyelids, there are cholesterol deposits. Obesity is another risk factor, so keep your weight down as much as possible. Now, another risk factor, which is a very, very high risk factor, is cigarette smoking. Cigarette smoking damages the arteries and blood cells and increases the incidence of heart attacks. The chances of you getting a heart attack if you are a smoker are nearly 10 times more if you smoke 20 cigarettes per day. So please cut your cigarette smoking down as far as possible and as quickly as possible. Small amounts of alcohol is okay, one to two drinks. But if you are drinking more than four drinks per day, then you'll land up with the gastroenterologist or the guy who looks after your liver rather than me. As I said, diabetes plays a very, very important role and you must keep your sugar down, especially if you're diabetic. So if you're diabetic, be careful. Do not take sugar. Don't take grapes. Don't take mangoes. Don't take sweet things. As far as eating is concerned, Take lots of fruits, vegetables, eat fruits and vegetables, knock off things like which have got fat in them, especially things like egg yolk, things like liver, things like butter, 
ghee, then malai, ice cream, and especially biscuits. So saturated fats should be reduced as far as possible, if you can. Exercise plays a very, very important part. And mortality is halved in retired people who walk two miles per day. So exercise is very, very important. What I do myself, I finish work by 6.37. I go straight to the gym for one hour. After finishing gym for one hour, I have a swim for another half an hour. And I've done this routinely, whether it's a Sunday, Saturday, or any other day. So exercise is very important. It keeps you fit. It increases the flow of blood in the coronary arteries. It increases your heart rate. And it burns up some of your sugars. So exercise, exercise, and exercise. Walk, walk, and walk. These are my simple... Uh, I told you these figures, so I'll tell you these figures again. Cholesterol less than 200, LDL less than 100, and HDL more than 400. These are the figures you must know by heart. 10% reduction of blood cholesterol produces 20% decline in coronary artery disease. So it is very, very important. Another risk factor is blood pressure. If you have got blood pressure, then it is very important that you keep your blood pressure under control because blood pressure, the heart has to work against resistance. Normal blood pressure is 120, 80. And if the blood pressure is well controlled, even with medication, it is very, very important to take that medication regularly. So if you've got blood pressure, reduce your salt and take regular medication lifelong. If you don't control your blood pressure, there is a much higher chance of you getting a stroke. So be careful. So as I said, control your blood sugar. Now this is what the normal arteries of the heart looks like, left and right. And this is a normal artery, which you can see the left part is the left coronary artery. The right is the right coronary artery. And here what has happened, the artery of the heart has suddenly got blocked, as you can see. And that is why you're getting that black spot on the heart. And that area of the heart has got infarcted or it has died. And that's why you get a tiny heart attack. This is the recovery room at Ruby Hall. The first thing that you do when a patient has a heart attack is to take an ECG. And the ECG will tell us where the heart attack is and whether he has really got a heart attack. The second thing we do is to do some blood enzymes and confirm the heart attack. And once we have confirmed that he has got a heart attack at Ruby Hall, what we do, we immediately take the patient into the cardiac catheter lab or the angiography unit. And we do angiography. We find out the blockage. We put a little balloon and over the balloon, we put a stent and we open up the blocked artery. So this is very important. This is called as angioplasty, where we put a balloon first. And over the balloon comes a little spring and the spring remains in the artery of the heart. And that spring keeps the artery completely open. So you can see this is the procedure. So first we put a balloon. Then we put another balloon with a spring and the spring remains in the artery of the heart. That is called as angioplasty. Ruby Hall does about six to eight angioplasties every day. And we have been doing this for the last nearly 35 to 40 years. So we are very experienced in this type of uh, treatment. When you have a problem, there's always relatives, friends, girlfriends giving advice. So finally, you should go to a good institution which has got a fully backup system. This is the first hybrid cat lab in Maharashtra. And I call it a hybrid cat lab because during angioplasty, if ever there is a complication, this particular cat lab, we can put the patient on bypass within one minute. Nobody else has a hybrid cat lab. So this is a very advanced cat lab that uh, Ruby Hall has got. So this is installed only two to three months ago. And uh, it's a very useful for doing angiography, angioplasty, especially very high risk patients. It's a very expensive piece of equipment costing more than 12 crores. This is an artery that is blocked in the heart. You can see on the right hand side, 
and this is on the left hand side is the artery which has been completely opened with angioplasty. Similarly, this is a patient who has got a blocked artery on the top left, you can see, and that artery has been fully opened with uh, angioplasty. This is the first case of stenting that I did at Ruby in Pune. This was done about 25 years ago. So you can see there is a marked advancement in technology. This is what the spring we use, marked advance of the technology. Now the springs come with special drugs which are inserted into the drugs and the chances of re-blockage or re-stenosis now is less than 1% in angiography and angioplasty. So this is the cardiac cath lab of Ruby Hall Clinic. We have done live transmissions from Pune to Bombay many times. This is the original when we started doing angioplasty. Initially, we used to get a lot of foreigners coming who did cases with us. But now, of course, we are doing it on our own. This lady's cholesterol was 800. She is the youngest patient in the whole world to undergo angioplasty at the age of 12. I put in two stents into her. We had put in two stents into her, our team, and since then she is doing very well. Her sister also had a very high cholesterol of nearly 500, and she unfortunately had to have her aortic valve replaced. So there are a lot of new technologies that are available. I will not go too much into this because we are talking today only of coronary artery disease. And I would like to take some questions rather than uh, uh, have a question answer session with you, because I'm sure there are a lot of questions you want to ask me about heart disease, how to prevent heart disease, what are the problems associated with heart disease. Thank you very much. Connect. Thank you very much, doctor. Thank you very much. I'm just going to. Uh, Take a minute to on the screen. But uh, he's outside. Doctor, indeed, uh, you know, you, you spoke about the Parsi genes and uh, it's, the Parsi uh, cuisine also is very well known. So how did you, how does uh, Dr. PKG manage uh, life with all the amazing food that you eat, that you have on offer and uh, everything else? See, my diet basically is quite strict. I don't know. My, uh, you, know, you know, my father died at the age of 92. No, I think may even more. And uh, I don't want to live like him because uh, what he used to do in the morning, he used to have one cup of tea with a little papaya. Afternoon, again, just a cup of coffee or something. And the night, one pomfret with chutney on it. And he used to walk from Ruby Hall all the way up the hill, Baker's Hill, every single day, which is about nine kilometers. He was very thin, and I think basically my dad died of starvation, if nothing else. So I don't want to be like him. My diet is in the morning, I have one cup of coffee without sugar. I have a toast, brown toast, and I take a little cheese with it. And then I have a little fruit. Normally it's an apple. That's my lunch. Sorry, that's my breakfast. For lunch, I have a salad which comes from home. It's a very light salad. And in the evening, I eat whatever I like. Mostly, I try to avoid these uh, rich type of Parsi foods, as you like. That happens once in a month or once in two months. But overall, it is quite strict. I don't take rice and I don't take uh, potatoes to keep my weight down. So I keep out of rice and potatoes. A drink a day is compulsory at night. Not in the day, ever. So a small drink of gin and tonic, whiskey doesn't suit me, so I can't. I take whiskey, my eyes get red, so I don't touch it. I take only a small gin and tonic at night. That also tonic with diet tonic, not the sugary one. Be very careful. So whiskey is good because you're taking soda with it. It doesn't contain many calories. And similarly, if you're drinking some other drink, take something which doesn't have sugar in it. It's very important. Right, doctor. I, I do I do remember interacting with your uh, illustrious father, and uh, I do remember how he was uh, fighting fit. Okay, we are going to get into questions. We have quite a few questions that have come in. Uh, so this is one from uh, uh, Mr. Narendra Shah, who is seventy one. His question is that he's had Corona COVID in 20, 2021 in March twenty twenty one, and uh, is there any specific precaution that he should take as a 
as a covid uh, uh, covid you know who who's had covid in the past see let's be clear i don't think anybody has really escaped covid uh, in uh, maharashtra or even pune i think most of us have had covid i've had it twice but both times i've had a very mild attack and that's in spite of taking all the vaccinations so what vaccination has done basically is to prevent you from getting a very serious affection and number 2 it has helped you protect your lungs those who have been vaccinated get a very mild uh, covid uh, reaction if you are going to get uh, covid my first attack i just got fever for a day and went away second time also fever for a day and went away no side effects nothing so because i was fully vaccinated similarly if you have been vaccinated then the chances of you getting any morbidity or mortality from covid is very 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 small what covid does basically it causes vasculitis that is inflammation of the arteries so you can get a much higher incidence of heart attack and we have seen in fact ruby hall has written a paper two papers which has been now uh, uh, presented in a paris meeting for the cardiologists where we found a very high incidence of coronary artery disease following affection by covid that means within a period of 3 months after covid there was a very high incidence of people getting heart attacks but now we are not finding now covid is practically gone i have not seen a case now in pune for the last at least 3 months so i think that's particularly good news what is happening can i ask you a question you mentioned about that within 3 months there is a big risk so can one say that you know since 3 months have passed uh, uh, the risk now the are... risk is very small so i think those patients who are at a high risk especially those who have got coronary artery disease those who have got diabetes those who have got blood pressure those who have family history of coronary artery disease those who are very obese these patients should take a small dose of aspirin ecosprin 75 at least for 3 months if they have had covid i think they should be protected this particular group i have not taken any medicine uh because luckily i'm been well so far so i have not taken anything myself but uh you should not exercise for at least a month after you've had uh, covid this is the, my advice to you great thank you doctor we have a question from mr shashikant lard who is 64 uh he says what are the risks doctor associated with long term intake of clobidogrel 75 mg along with atova 20 mg see the main risk of clobidogrel what is clobidogrel it is nothing but a blood thinner it's an antiplatelet drug the main risk is of bleeding and the chances of you bleeding on clobidogrel is very very small of flavix it is called uh you can get bleeding anywhere in the brain you can get bleeding in the gastrointestinal tract but the chances of that happening are very very tiny and very very small so i don't think it's a big problem always take the drug after food don't take it in an empty stomach that is my advice to you and we have got thousands and thousands of patients on these blood thinning tablets so don't worry about it it's very very safe normally after angioplasty we give blood thinning tablets for a period of about 1 year that is clopidogrel and aspirin uh, or we have got some others which i don't want to go too much into the technical part of it it's called brillianta but after 1 year you can stop the clopidogrel and only continue with ecosprin 75 the chances of bleeding with ecosprin 75 are practically zero thank you uh, we have a question from mr ak chopra who is 73 he says my bp and cholesterol level is within normal range recently the tmt test my performance was okay but the stress test was positive uh, he is seeking advice see stress test can also be false positive so if you have got a positive stress test the best thing to do is to do a cardiac ct scan we have it at ruby hall it's a very simple test it takes only 10 seconds to do the test 
But the only problem is that you have to take a tablet called a beta blocker, which is given two hours before. So the heart rate slows down slightly. Then you come to us fasting, you go into the machine and it is like doing an angiogram, but there is no catheter, there is no tube put into your heart. So we can find out whether you have any major blockages or no. If you do not have any blockages, you don't need to do anything. If you've got a major blockage, then you need to do an angiogram to find out further information. Because a cardiac CT will only tell us that you have a blockage, it won't quantify how much the block it is. So it is better to confirm with normal angiography. So this is the thing what you should be doing. Thank you. We have a question from Mr. Brijendra Kumar, who's 79, based in Mumbai. Uh, he's had two angioplasties in 2012 and 2016. Uh, my ejection fraction is 34%. What precautions do I need to take at this low EF? So there are certain drugs which are available which can increase the EF. The drug is called uh, Vimada, but it should be used carefully under cardiology supervision, number one. Number two, he should, uh, now it's been about more than 10 years since his last uh, angioplasty. So I would at least do a modified stress test to see whether the stents are working well, or if we can get a cardiac CT, that would also help to tell us whether the stents are functioning well. So I think every 10 years, you need to make sure that your stents are perfect. So he should be on Echosprint. He should be on this new drug called Vimada. Sometimes a mild diuretic. I think he's, he's got blood pressure, you said? Uh, that's right. He said no, is, is he got blood pressure as well or not? If he's got blood pressure, it should we should control his blood pressure. If he's he a diabetic, he's anyway, if he's got diabetic, he should make sure that his blood sugar is well under control, and he should take mild exercises every day. Very important. Thank you, doctor. There's a question from uh, uh, Vijayalakshmi Ganduri. Says, doctor, is it better for the for a hypertension patient? to keep a sorbitrate tablet handy? No, not necessary. Uh, because sorbitrate, if you take and you're a hypertension, you can drop your blood pressure also quite a lot, quite steeply, and you can become, you know, a little bit dizzy and uh, unconscious, sometimes very rarely. So better not to do that. Instead, control your blood pressure properly with proper blood pressure medicines. Remember the normal blood pressure in an elderly, I'm talking now, if you're about 70, I would say anything up to 140 by 80, 85 would be fine. For a young person, I would say 120 over 80. But as you go older and older, you can have a slightly uh, higher blood pressure. It is acceptable as normal. But you must take your medication. Once you're hypertensive or BP, you must take medicine lifelong. And the medicine should be properly controlled by a reasonably a uh, good doctor who's a good physician. Uh, doctor, there is a question uh, is that uh, Dr. Pune is very, very difficult for us to come. Do you all also do, does your hospital also do teleconsults? Do, do we do? Teleconsults. Yes, we do teleconsultation. Yes, we do. We do. So those of you who are interested, you can uh, contact the Ruby All Clinic uh, Hospital and the uh, coordinates are there on the website. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Shikant Kulkarni, who is 71. Uh, is metropolol a safe medicine for a person undertaking <laughs> only hypertension, anti-hypertension treatment? See, uh, beta blockers are very, very safe drugs. They've been there for more than 50 years or maybe longer also. Metoprolol is nothing but a beta blocker. And normal, the dose is some people take 25 milligrams, others take 50 milligrams. But I worked in England for more than 10 years, and there we used to give up to 100 milligrams, which is very safe. But they are bigger people, so we are, Indians are a little smaller. But we need a smaller dose. The normal dose would be 25 or 50, depending on the person's weight and height. It's a very good drug. It can be taken long term, and it has got very few side effects. So it's a very safe drug. Continue with it. If on metoprolol your blood pressure is under control, you don't need to do anything more. 
just make sure that it is under control. If it is not under control, you can add some other. There are so many new, more modern drugs which have come out for hypertension, blood pressure. Uh, doctor, we have a question from Dr. Vinita Nalavadi, who asks, should every patient of DM undergo CAG? Every patient of uh, low EF you're talking about. Every patient of DM should... should Diabetes mellitus, yeah. yeah. Okay. Undergo CAG. Uh, no, what I think uh, every patient of diabetes necessarily does not to, does not need to go under coronary angiography at all. I think patients who are diabetic and who are diabetic for more than 10 years, I think that is the group of patients that we need to actually make sure that the coronary arteries are normal. What happens when what in diabetics is that the coronary diameter we find is slightly smaller than the normal coronary. For example, a patient has got three millimeter coronary arteries diameter, millimeters. Then in diabetics, we find it becomes 2.5. That's why the blood flow doesn't go at the same speed. It's like a pipe. The blood doesn't go at the same speed. That's the reason they get blockages. And what happens in diabetics they get silent myocardial infarctions. That means that artery can suddenly block off and you may not even get pain and you may not even know you're having a heart attack, but you have a heart attack. The heart attack can be picked up on the ECG or the blood enzymes. So diabetics are a particular group. You need to handle them very carefully, especially diabetics who are on insulin. So there are two types of diabetics, those who are on insulin and those who are not on insulin. Then there are also diabetics who are born with, with a, you know, there's called infantile diabetics or congenital diabetics. They are more prone and they are need to be more on insulin lifelong. Some diabetics are taking insulin three times in a day. So diabetes is a complete different kettle of fish. Diabetes does affect the coronary artery disease, but over a period of time. So you need to be more careful handling diabetics. No, you can do CT angios in diabetics and also find out whether they have got blockages. Normally, I would recommend a diabetic to first undergo a stress test. If the stress test is fine, maybe you can get away with it. If the stress test is even mildly positive, go for a CT angio. Nowadays, the new CT angios are very safe compared to the old CT angios which we used to see. The radiation level is like taking only two or three x-rays. So technology has improved considerably. Most of the CT angios are now the 128 cycle CT angios. Try not to do it on a 64 machine because there you get a little higher radiation. But now the new machines have come out, which are 256 cycles per minute. And in that, the radiation is like taking a simple X-ray. And you don't even need to take a beta blocker. You just walk into the machine, you get into the machine, the machine spins it around, and you get your report in color immediately. So technology is moving at a very, very fast rate. <laughs> Thank you, doctor. We have a question from Katie Dadaji. Uh, she's a Kusrobag uh, uh, resident, so I must... You can perhaps uh, pay more attention to this question. <laughs> Do we read, we, Doctor, we read in the papers that there's a newer technique whereby instead of an open heart surgery for blockages, there's minimally invasive method for bypass surgery, which is less invasive. Would, would that, that's question one. Second question is, would taking statins all our life not affect our liver? I take the first question. I didn't uh, follow the second one. The first question was about minimal invasive cardiac surgery. Right. See, as far as, let's go step by step. First is if you've got mild coronary artery disease, you take only medical line of treatment. That means you take medicines. Second, much preferred would be angioplasty because there's no cutting in that. So angioplasty would be the second thing. When angioplasty came in and bypasses came in, Angioplasty was initially very less. Now, 75 to 80 percent of patients undergo angioplasty, and we can open three arteries, four arteries, calcified arteries. 
So technology of angioplasty has gone up substantially and phenomenal progress has been made. If the arteries are very badly blocked, if they are not angioplastiable, if they are very highly calcified and small arteries, only then we subject our patients to bypass surgery. Now, bypass surgeries are of, again, two types. One is on the pump and one is without the pump. Putting a patient on the pump has got a slightly higher morbidity than on a beating heart. So we don't stop the heart while we are operating. We do all arterial to arterial surgeries at Ruby Hall. So we connect the artery to the artery. So we don't have to cut the legs also. So the technology has improved phenomenally. Now, the talking about minimal invasive cardiac surgery. Yes, we are doing minimal invasive cardiac surgery. In that, we don't cut the sternum, but we go from the side. So we make an incision over here. And through this incision, we do the cardiac surgery. But minimal invasive, we cannot do for all patients. We can only do it if there is one artery or two arteries blocked and the patient needs cardiac surgery. So minimal invasive is not practiced that much as open heart surgery is practiced, which is a much simpler procedure. Normally, patients stay six to eight days in the hospital after open heart surgery. And the success rate now is more than 99.5%. So the success rate is practically 100% in all the patients. And it's a artery to artery. So artery to artery, the grafts remain open for at least 25 years. So there are no longer vein grafts. We used to have problems with vein grafts. But in Pune now, we do not do vein grafts at all. We have not done it for the last 20 years. Right. Thank you, doctor. We have... Uh... Jayanti, who is 62, uh, who asked, is there any other way, like a scan, uh, to find out how many blocks, other than that is taking an angiogram? That is oh, I told you, there's a CT scan. Do a CT scan, and the CT scan will definitely tell you, provided the CT score is not very high. If the CT score is very high, that means you have got a lot of blockages, then you should go. So what we do is we screen the patient on a CT machine, we do what is called as a scoring. If the scoring is more than 400 or less than 400, if it is less than 400, then you can do the CT angio. If it is very high calcium scoring, then it is better to go straight for an angiogram. So this is a good test. We can also do, I don't know if you know, but there is also a test called as a thallium stress test, which is slightly better than a normal stress test. So you can do a thallium stress test. If the thallium stress test is normal, you may not need an angiogram. That means the heart is getting adequate blood supply. If the heart is not getting adequate blood supply, obviously you'll have to do an angiogram. Right, doctor. Thank you. We have two more questions uh, I might ask. One is from an anonymous attendee who asks, doctor, what is the reason for heavy breathing? He is, uh, it's, it's a lady who's age 70. Heavy breathing? That's right. There are many causes of heavy breathing. One, it might be you, it might be coronary artery disease itself, or it might be diseases in the lung, or it can be due to severe obesity. You can get obstructive lung disease can causing heavy breathing. You can get a lot of fluid overload, renal failure that can cause heavy breathing. So there are many causes like even heart failure. If the heart is not pumping, normal pumping should be 60%. If it's going to be 15%, you're going to get heavy breathing. So well, these are all many causes of uh, heavy breathing. It can be endocrine causes. There are so many causes of heavy breathing. So you have to identify it and treat it. A pneumonia can cause heavy breathing. All right? Hmm. Doctor, we have a slightly longish question. Uh, this is a May, uh, Somesh Java, who is 68. He is suffering from HOCM, was diagnosed about 25 years back. Ever since he has been on atenolol, uh, first few years was on atenolol, 25 mg OD, and then on uh, 50 mg OD since the last 16 to 17 years. He says, I'm on treatment of PGIMR, uh, PGIMER, Chandigarh. My doctor has tried putting on other medications, but nothing has suited as far as arresting of symptoms are concerned. Recently, since the last 18 to 19 months, my symptoms of syncope and breathless have increased. I was in the US during COVID and had taken Pfizer COVID vaccine in June 2021. After taking my meals, it becomes very difficult to do a physical activity. 
Also, walking is very difficult. This happens for long hours, and then there is time for another meal. To cut it short, my doctor in PGI Chandigarh uh, Rick suggests to go for septal myoctomy. Uh, it's called uh, alcohol ablation. What we do, we have done many cases like this. We have done, I think, more than 5,000 or maybe more. It is called a septal ablation. First of all, we need to do a good echo to see what is the gradient across in the hokum or hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. Then what we do is in the first perforator, we take alcohol, 100% alcohol, and put the alcohol in the first perforator. Now, the first perforator is a branch of the LAD artery, left anterior descending artery. So the first branch that comes out is called the first perforator. We take a catheter and put the catheter in the first perforator. Then we have to be very, very careful that the alcohol doesn't spill into the main LAD. Because if you spill it into the main LED, the main LED will get blocked. And that's the main artery of the heart. So what we do, we make sure that there is a catheter put in. Over the catheter, we put a balloon. The balloon is then placed in the first uh, uh, accessory artery, first diagonal artery. Not diagonal, first uh, perforator artery. Once that is done, then we inject a small amount of alcohol into the artery. We actually cause a small heart attack. We make the guy have a tiny heart attack, which he will have mild chest pain. Maybe it lasts for an hour or so and go away. Once that artery is blocked, that muscle supply to the hokum is blocked off and the heart function definitely improves. So this is called as catheter ablation. It's a very known procedure, very safe procedure. And we have done more than uh, 5,000. Right. <laughs> One last question, doctor. Does metformin for diabetes affect the kidneys? They say that taking it over a very long period of time might affect, see, the diabetes itself affects the kidneys. Now, whether it is metformin or the diabetes, it's because it's called nephropathy, diabetic nephropathy. So if you take metformin, it does affect the kidneys, but that takes long time. It can take 15 years. It doesn't happen overnight. There are better anti-diabetic drugs. I'm not a diabetologist, so I don't go into that. Well, I only do pure cardiology. But having said that, I think uh, diabetes can affect any organ of the body. It can affect the heart. It can affect the kidneys. It can affect the brain. It can affect uh, the, the peripheral vascular, you know, your legs. So it's, it's a chronic disease. And eventually if you take it over a very long period of time, it can land up on dialysis. So it's not, it's, a, it's a very slow progress. So it must be controlled properly, the blood sugar in diabetic patients. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Grant, for uh, this amazing session. As you can see, Dr., we have, have quite a few senior citizens and people above 75, 80 who are asking questions and who are exceedingly active, as they always are. And it is... <laughs> Uh, you know, indeed, a, a great thing that they are all joining, and we are able to get uh, doctors like yourself, who uh, part with uh, information and part with knowledge and 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 give a live advice. Uh, uh, doctor, as I mentioned to you earlier, we've been doing these sessions for uh, on two and a half years, and uh, we continue to do it every Saturday at 5 p.m. Uh, that's what we do. We do a host of other activities as well. Tomorrow morning, uh, we have. What is called Seniors Have Talent, which is a special singing contest for seniors mm -hmm. only above the age of 60. And that is in its 10th season. We have had 10 seasons already of mm -hmm. that. And they are all senior citizens who are vying for a senior uh, uh, singing superstar trophy. And uh, that's what we are. And we will be back again next Saturday at 5 p.m. for uh, a session of Health Live. Thank you, Dr. Grant. And thank you, Ruby Hall, for facilitating this. Uh, uh, it was a great You're session. welcome. And look forward to seeing you again. <laughs>